Welcome to everybody. Thank you so much for waiting as we get set up. Um, it's incredible for us at ECPO to welcome you along to our first webinar on coping during COVID-19 uh, with obesity. Um, next slide, please. Uh, just to remind you all that we do have a question and answers function. We have got a lot of questions that have been sent in prior this webinar, which will be answered. We will try to collate all the, the questions that come up during this session. Um, and if we don't get to them, we will circulate them after. Uh, we will be sharing the slides and the webinar shortly after. Uh, we encourage you to share it, uh, especially with your patient community, and hopefully enjoy. Next slide, please. This is our agenda for today, as you can see. Um, myself, Vicky Mooney, we have Cherie Bryant, who will give us a piece on COVID and obesity, which is of paramount importance. Uh, I will address some patient concerns. We will move on with uh, Professor Jason Halford on psychology of appetite and obesity, a presentation from Jason. We will then have some comments and a review and remarks from Dr. Patrick Ritz. Uh, we have got a question and answer session for 20 minutes then. Cherie will moderate this and we will have some final remarks and closing. Next slide, please. As you can see, here are your moderators and speakers for today. Um, Dr. Patrick Ritz is from France. Professor, Professor Jason Halford from IASO is from the UK. Uh, Cherie Bryan from IASO in the UK and myself, I am in Lanzarote of Spain. And without that, I'll move to the next slide and introduce Cherie Bryant. Cherie. Hi there, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join. I know it's a difficult time for everyone. So let's talk about what COVID-19 is about. What are the symptoms? COVID-19 is a coronavirus and coronaviruses are a family of viruses which can cause illness in humans and animals. It's COVID-19 uh, was, was unknown before it uh, broke out in Wuhan, China in December 2019. And the most common symptoms, as I'm sure you've heard many times, are fever, tiredness, and dry cough. Some patients also have aches and pains, nasal congestion, sore throats, and diarrhea. The symptoms usually begin to be mild and gradually. Some people, however, who become infected don't develop symptoms and don't feel unwell. Around 80% recover from the disease without needing special treatment. But one in six of everyone who does get the disease becomes seriously ill and, and develops some breathing difficulties. So who's at higher risk and how do we prevent infection? Older people and those with underlying medical problems, including hypertension, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and obesity are more likely to develop serious illness and have serious complications. People who develop fever and cough with difficulty breathing should urgently seek medical attention. People can catch COVID-19 from others who have the virus. The disease can spread through small droplets, which are spread from the person who uh, has COVID-19, who coughs or exhales. Effective ways to pr protect yourself and others. As you know, I'm sure you've been talking about it in your countries, include frequent hand washing, covering your mouth with the bend of your elbow or a Kleenex, and maintaining physical distancing. Government recommendations across Europe differ. Some suggest a distance of one meter apart and others recommend two meters. So if you do have symptoms, what should you do? If you have obesity and you experience these hallmark symptoms, it's important to continue taking your current prescribed medication and contact your doctor or local health authority. They'll be able to advise you on what to do. And of course, the shortness of breath symptom is the one we all become concerned about. 
do remember that most people who, who get COVID-19 will have a relatively mild illness, but since people living with obesity are at higher risk of complications, it's important to take care and be alert to that symptom. IASO urges people with obesity to take precautions to avoid infection. You can learn more on the IASO website. ECPO also has an excellent set of resources. We include here uh, our links to an infographic on what you need to know. Please feel free to share this as well as individual country resources from every country in the EASO community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cherie. Thank you so much. Um, so just moving on briefly before we speak with uh, Jason and uh, Patrick, one thing that uh, ECPO has done here this week is we put a questionnaire out to the patient community to try to identify some of their concerns. Um, next slide, please, Sheree. And what we see here is we have obviously folks who have challenges, who have barriers and have probably some misinformation. So the evidence-based information in COVID-19 and obesity is of paramount uh, importance to patients. Like myself, I'm a patient. And the reason for this is that you know, there's so much misinformation around um, you know, are we at higher risk? Are we not at higher risk? And just to clarify that as patients living with obesity, we may not be at higher risk of developing COVID-19. However, if we do contract it, we are at higher risk for more serious um, and severe symptoms and disease progression. So I think it's important that folks have actual information and these some of the challenges that they're facing. Impact obviously of social and um, physical distancing. Um, and Jason will approach hedonic eating and we'll look later as well at mental health and motivation uh, and other concerns. The questionnaire that we put out is not an academic uh, survey. So this was purely to identify some concerns. We did have just under 200 responses in a 24 hour period, um, predominantly from Western European and it was circulated by social media. Of those 92% were folks who live with obesity and 8% were those who work with or care for somebody uh, who has obesity. Next slide please, Sheree. Uh, what are patients concerned about? So 73% of those who responded said that they had concerns regarding um, obviously contracting COVID-19. Uh, um, and obviously, like this is a, such a high number. Um, their mental health has also been affected in the current situation with 60% advising that they are struggling on a daily basis. Um, and their motivation levels are actually quite high. You can see here 61% said they're struggling daily to motivate themselves. So not only is their mental health affected, their motivation. Next slide, please, Sheree. We asked, obviously, with this being our first webinar, about um, your eating patterns and behaviors. I know myself as a patient, and I find I'm constantly hungry. So as you can see here, um, only 19% of those who had responded um, are actually eating as normal. So we had a, a small word cloud kind of developed. If we just click along there and you'll see some of the, I suppose the words that folks had advised, they're struggling, they're binge eating, they're overeating. And these are all the things that we want to address. Um, and on that note, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Jason Halford to uh, move us along. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky, and hello, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Jason Holford. I'm a psychologist from the University of Leeds, and I'm going to be talking a little bit uh, about appetite uh, 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 and obesity, and also the implications of that when you're self-isolating in this new situation that we all find ourselves in, but is very, very challenging when you're trying to maintain uh, your normal eating control strategies and trying to maintain your health. So next slide. There are a number of components of appetite that when we look at, at, at people's uh, ability to exert control over their eating behavior that we study. 
First of all, we ask what uh, uh, processes lead to eating. Well, first of all, hunger, the drive to consume. And hunger is a very general thing. But actually, what is uh, critically more important is wanting. The motivation to consume specific foods, often you experience those through cravings. Those cravings can be particularly acute when you're denied those food sources or you're trying to actively give them up. Uh, but also liking it, so the pleasure elicited from food. It's that comfort also that comes from that pleasure as well, which is important. Well, what should normally lead us to stop eating? Well, process association within a meal, they're critical, the, the feedback you normally get through a meal, and also the post-meal signals generated from the gut, uh, which should decrease hunger through the day. And those mechanisms don't particularly function well, and they function even worse as you get to higher levels of BMI. Next slide. Well, what's the implications for this? Well, if you have weakened uh, satiation and satiety, food is not filling you in the way that it should do, and it's not suppressing the, your appetite in the way it should do. And also, if you've got a greater responsiveness to food cues, and that you could experience that through cravings, but also just all automatic orientations to those cues as well, then it means that your eating behavior is being driven hedonically. Now, the ask then is that you've got weakened satiety and you've got overactivity in the reward section. It's very difficult for the individual to what we call exert inhibitory control. That's not weak willedness, that's actually the effort. So it's lots of efforts going in, but actually that effort achieving anything is very, very difficult. So under normal circumstances, when you're living with obesity, because of the biology of obesity, you'll have impaired control of eating behavior. Now under the current circumstances, all the strategies that people living with obesity have been used have been using to control their food intake have been robbed. You've lost those strategies. Those things that you've developed to help you manage day to day have been taken from you. Next slide. Now, as always, with uh, looking at obesity, the challenge is not just the biological weaknesses there, which make it very difficult for people to exert the behavioral control that they want. There is also the food environment, and that's around the novelty of food, the numerous uh, opportunities for convenient eating with little preparation, the increase of in inexpensive energy drinks, foods and soft drinks, fats and sugars, and unreasonably large portion sizes. And these are part of our whole food environment. Now, obviously, our food environment has changed because we're self-isolating and many of us are limited on the number of times we can go shopping, where we can go shopping and also what's in the shops. And I think there's a lot of anxiety, not only about eating, but actual food availability and the quality of food available to us as well. I think that adds to some of the emotional uh, problems and challenges we face when trying to control our diet, but also Critically, it has an impact in the home, on the home food environment as well. Next slide. Now, I'll just put this slide in because many of you may not be actively trying to engage in weight management, but some people are and some people will be trying to diet through this period. And we know that dieting is difficult and dieting is difficult is because whatever your weight status, your biology actively resists this. Uh, uh, hormones called leptin and GLP-1 drop, and those are the hormones which help you maintain lower weight, and hormones such as ghrelin increase, and ghrelin is a hunger hormone. So you're fighting again against biology, which leads to increased appetite and increased preference for energy-dense foods, foods which are high in fat and sugar. Now, if you go onto the ECPO or the EASO uh, site, we do have some basic tips on energy intake as well as energy expenditure as well. Now, some of you will be familiar with these tips, but it is worth re-examining them in the context of the new situation you are, because the strategies you based on those tips will be different at home. Next slide. I think finally, what I want to say is, Increased energy intake is an understandable response to the environmental and biological realities of living with obesity. It's what you guys are living with, what we are living with day to day. It's particularly critical to understand under stressful times. But there is a wider issue, not just focusing on eating behavior and appetite, that I think we should think about. Next slide. Now, there is a 
association between mental health and obesity, particularly uh, depression. Obesity and being overweight increases the risk of depression and depression increases the risk for developing obesity. And when we track this, we can track this bi-directional relationship right the way back into childhood. And of course, when we look at obesity and when we treat obesity, when we talk about obesity, we should always be very cognizant that we need to think about mental health and we need to think about the life course of somebody's obesity journey or, or their journey with struggling with their body weight. Next slide. Now we can see that in terms of the impact of life events and when we think about uh, depression, we think about stress, we think about events that could cause that and their lasting effects. I mean some events are, are, can be positive ones such as marriage and pregnancy, others one could be quite stressful such as depression, uh, such as uh, issues in the family, death, bereavement, divorce, uh, issues around work and I think if we, many of us, if we can draw our weight histories, we can see where these uh, events impact on our, on our weight profile. Now, what's critical in understanding this is these are stressors, and it's the way that we cope with the stressors which often impacts in terms of our eating behavior and our ability to try and control our body weight. Next slide. Now, if we're going to talk about impactful events and life changing events, I think we're actually living in one that many of us will never live through the present. Unless you've lived through a world war, we'll never live through again. And we know that from the literature generally, sorry, back one. So we can just wait for Shri to go back a slide or two. So anyway, I'll carry on talking uh, uh, about the, yeah, about this slide here. Thanks, Shui. What we know is that there is a big psychological impact of quarantine. And one of the, one of the things is, is how do we mitigate that? How do we reduce it both in the medium term, as in within quarantine and going into quarantine, but also after we come out of quarantine as well. And you know, have negative psychological effects, including post-traumatic stress uh, uh, symptoms, confusion and anger. And people are angry because they're isolated. They've lost all their normal means of control. I mean, lots of feelings that we see around uh, extremes emotions, anger, frustration, psychosocial stresses, and also to a certain degree interpersonal uh, relations as well. I mean, we love and like our family, but we're not quite equipped for this degree of a proximity to them all the time. <laughs> now, stressors include quarantine duration, infection fears, and obviously, given what we talked about in terms of obesity and COVID, they're there, frustration, boredom we've talked about, Inadequacy of supplies, and that's really been critical when we have seen the problems around food availability and trying to find healthy things. Inadequate and reliable information. Financial loss. You know, many people are out of work and thinking about how are they going to, what's their financial future? And I think critically also stigma. Now, the stigma of actually catching the disease and being somebody who is a COVID case. Uh, there's also stigma about being uh, being obese and feeling that you're an unnecessary burden to the healthcare system and I think you know that self blame there uh, whereas actually thinking that you know you have a valid need and right to have treatment and have protection and there's also the stigma all, all these memes which have gone around around becoming fat oh yeah look at me I'm going to become fat of the covid and all these pictures of, of fat babies or fat animals people are, are, are sending around so these are all the sorts of things going along and there will also be long lasting effects of this as well. I mean, what's my treatment journey going to be after I come out of this period of isolation? How am I going to access help? And, you know, what have been the physical and mental consequences of this going forward once we come out of quarantine? Next slide. Now, when we talk about stress, mood, dietary restraint, we know that stress and mood have an impact, a negative impact on our ability to control our eating behaviour. And in this situation, we're experiencing a lot of stress and it's having a deleterious effect to many of us on our mood. And that affects the coping strategies that we employ to control our eating behaviour. And we may flip from some of those more functional coping strategies to those coping strategies which just help us regulate our emotions and, and get us through the day. And, you know, 
they don't necessarily help us deal with the temptations in the normal way that we can do and they don't necessarily help us deal with the consequences of lapses and that means a loss of dietary control that means uh, 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 diminished feelings of self-efficacy and weight managed failure which again has a negative impact on mood and stress so we get into that negative cycle next slide now, I just want to say a little bit about temptations and lapses before I, I finish up. Now, temptations are a sudden urge to break diet when you're close to the brink. And obviously, there are appetite triggers for temptations, greater hunger, feelings of less fullness, and there are also mood triggers as well. Sadness, feelings of deprivation, stress and boredom, feeling less relaxed, and feeling less feelings of being in control. Interestingly, they can happen particularly anywhere. But when we talk about lapses, Lapses have the same appetitive triggers, we have the same mood triggers, but interesting, look at the situation triggers. They're by and large at home, in the evenings, at weekends, and that's the situation that we are all in at the moment. So we're in a particularly vulnerable situation for lapses. And we need to look at our usual coping mechanisms and look at the current situation in terms of re reducing our exposure to temptations, not always easy when you're confined, prevent them triggering lapses but also managing the consequences of lapses and realizing lapses aren't the end of the world and that you're on a pathway here and looking for the support to help you with these coping strategies next slide now EASO ECPO have, uh, have built uh, brought out some uh, guidance on resilience and mental health and some of these are very basic things which you do normally following regular schedules establishing objectives Keeping well informed, I mean, that's particularly important in the current crisis, but remember, don't over uh, uh, immerse yourself in information and be careful where you get for the information from because it can be very anxiety provoking. Again, limiting caffeine with anxiety is probably quite wise and talking about prioritizing active activities to keep your mind active and using relaxation techniques are a way of combating anxiety as well, but critically, Stay in contact, you know, that self-isolation thing is a big issue. And if you can rely on the supports of trusted friends or family, but also support groups, that would be is particularly useful as well. You can get the resource on the website and the links to further resources as well from that on the ECPO and EASO website. Next slide. This is just because many of those tips were around anxiety. I just put this slide in from the uh, UK National Health Service, Every Mind Matters, Anxiety Management Tips. And this just expands on some of the things we talked about in terms of staying connected, and maintaining healthy relationships, talking about your worries and getting support from others, uh, working on schedules of feeling more prepared. I think number five is critical, looking after your body. The exercise and the energy intake is not just about weight management and it's not just about that, it's about self-care. And I think what we need to do is focus on, a lot more on self-care during the situation. Again, stick to the facts as well and uh, avoid some of the social media coverage of, of, of the current pandemic. Finding things that you do which is enjoyable to find rewarding uh, and focusing on the present, uh, focusing on the present rather than, than worrying about the future and over things you can't necessarily control at the moment is quite important. And finally, looking after your sleep as well. Quality sleep has a big impact on physical and mental, mental health. So getting enough sleep and maintaining regular patterns of sleep is important. That again speaks to activities, anxiety reduce, 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 reducing things, reducing your screen time, particularly before you go to bed as well. So finally, increased intake is an understandable response to the environmental and biological realities of living with obesity, particularly during stressful time. The current situation is unprecedented and promises a draft, dramatic challenge to people living with obesity. However, there are opportunities to learn new skills and new strategies and gain access to new support networks, which hopefully should help you see through this current period of time. And hopefully we'll be able to get to a point where we can work together with the patient community to address their needs coming out the other end of this quarantine period, this unprecedented period that we're living through. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. 
I don't hear Vicki on the, on, on the line, so I will introduce our colleague, uh, Professor Patrick Ritz, who is Professor of Clinical Nutrition in Toulouse and has spent his career working in obesity and eating disorders. They have some very interesting programs there in the south of France. Uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Ritz, if you would, would uh, share a few comments with us, please, about uh, your work and how you're managing there in France with the current crisis. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, first, uh, congratulations for uh, putting together all this uh, amount of information. Reading the slides from uh, Jason, and especially the last one with the 10 tips, I feel like uh, I'm going to translate it straight away and give it, uh, make it available for the patients. Um, um, to be more serious, uh, we need to share uh, the correct information, and Jason has said so. Uh, Huey and Vicky have said so. So this is very, very important that uh, we get the most accurate information as possible. Uh, in the south of France, we are very lucky at the moment because there are very few uh, patients that are suffering from uh, uh, this infection, uh, which is not the case in the north or the east of France, who where um, the number of patients has been uh, uh, very, very important. So what we do here in uh, Toulouse, in the south of France, at the moment is prevent people from coming to the hospital. Uh, it is a matter of uh, preventing infection to go from one person to the other, and we are only inviting uh, the patients uh, with a severe enough situation uh, to come to the hospital and as far as possible use uh, um, e-medicine, e-consultation, teleconsultation, video conferences uh, to uh, help people cope uh, with the situation. Uh, this is a, a tool that is important uh, we can get access to a nurse, a dietitian, a psychologist, um, a medical doctor uh, uh, through uh, these means. These means. Uh, then uh, I'm lucky enough in my team to have uh, dietitians and uh, psychologists who are used to uh, deal with all these matters of. Uh, anxiety, depression, compulsions, uh, binge eating, and so on. So um, at the moment, we are very careful about it, and we make ourselves available to the patients we know uh, for phone conversations and so on. And uh, the psychologist that works with me, Aurélie, who is on the phone as well, uh, but... Um, and luckily uh, speaks very little English. Uh, Aurélie uh, has people on the phone every day. And what she says is that it's not only one call that is important. It's also uh, the fact that after one call, Aurélie can call again the patients that uh, needs us. So one advice I would give to patients is if you feel uneasy, if you feel in need of help, uh, try to find someone uh, among uh, your health system that is able to, to help. Um, and finally, my last comment goes to Jason because I think his presentation was really, really good and really clear. And I think that now uh, we are about to answer the questions. Is that the program? Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Patrick. Really appreciate it. So we do have some questions that have been shared already. I will um, be happy to. Huh. I will be happy to let Vicky say a few words. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Patrick I, and, and Jason. I think particularly uh, we have quite a number of ten attendees that are people who live with obesity and some of your remarks and obviously the presentation that's delivered there um, 
really help us understand um, what, what is happening at the moment in our lives, you know, and I think one of the things that Jason mentioned there regarding the situation, um, you know, one of the reasons that we, we may lack um, in our diet is, you know, we're at home or we're stuck in at the weekend or our evening times is our, you know, I might pick in the evenings. Um, I know myself, I'm, I'm terrible. I'm always hungry in the evenings. And that is one of the reasons that we lack. And unfortunately, we're all stuck home now, you know, and there's a lot of self-blame and a lot of uh, we're, we've seen in the questionnaire of people saying they're, you know, they feel like they're failures. They feel like they're beating themselves up in their own mind, that they're not doing good enough, that they're constantly hungry. So I really appreciate that you address this and give us some insight into what is actually happening with ourselves. Um, and I think one thing that it was touched on that we will definitely approach in another webinar is this new wave of stigma, right? So we're seeing all of these memes and pictures pass around of somebody who has obesity. And it could be, heaven's sake, it could be a picture of me, um, you know, and, you know, the tummy is hanging out and people, uh, the average person saying, oh, you know, this is so funny. This is how we're all going to be, you know, um, no beach bodies this year. And I think we're going to face a whole new challenge coming out of this that we will have to address, of course. So I really appreciate that. Um, I think, Patrick, you have a, a great view and from what I believe you work with patients so closely. And so we really appreciate that. I, I'd like to hand over to Cherie for the questions and answers. We did get quite a few in um, prior to this. So we can, I think, jump straight in, Cherie. Thank you, Vicki. Um, the first question is about a patient who has had bariatric surgery. Um, and the question is, I've had bariatric surgery and I initially lost a lot, a lot of weight. I'm finding my old behaviors creeping in. So I think they're looking for some guidance here. Well, uh, Patrick, if, if I, if I uh, answer, um, we know that uh, there is a sort of a honeymoon after bariatric surgery, uh, which lasts for uh, 12 to 18 or 24 months, during which things are relatively easy. And then after two years and uh, a series of publications of and scientific works in the in the US have well demonstrated that for 20 to 40 percent of the people weight increases again not as much as it was before surgery but there is an increase and every patient I know who has been operated is afraid of the first kilogram that is uh, taken um, that is gained. So um, gaining weight after bariatric surgery is one of the issues. Uh, it is not because people do badly that it occurs. It probably is something related to the behavior, the behavior, physical activity, eating behavior, the conditions uh, uh, around us, uh, the family conditions, the stress conditions, and, and so on. And um, what we believe today is that it is not the, the, the people's fault. It is uh, something that needs to be learned uh, how to improve our behaviors. So in this context of stress, I'm not surprised that people will gain weight. And I would suggest that the, the, the tips that were given by uh, Jason are very good to handle uh, the difficulties that people have and that may lead to uh, behaviors from before surgeries uh, coming again. Thank you, Patrick. Since I have you here, um, there's another question from someone who's, who's had bariatric surgery and is concerned about their um, intake of vitamins. Um, and so the question is, I had bariatric surgery. I'm really worried about my vitamins. Should I be taking more than usual? 
maybe that's because of the stress. What if I can't get them, what should I do? So it's a good idea, good, good question. I think it's a very, very good question. Uh, what I would say is, uh, first, it all depends whether uh, at the beginning of this period, uh, there were deficiencies or not. If there were no deficiencies in vitamins, in iron, in copper or whatever, there is no reason today to imagine that uh, the needs in vitamins, in iron are increased. So the usual um, treatment with vitamins should be enough. This is uh, the first thing. If there, was, uh, if there were deficiencies before, then it's an other issue. And um, maybe an advice from the dietitian or the, from the medical doctor or from the surgeon that is um, uh, working on your project is useful uh, to know uh, what to do if you are short of vitamins, if uh, you need more, or if you can follow the same path. As far as um, uh, getting the vitamins is concerned, there, there are today uh, through the internet uh, some uh, very reliable sources of vitamins. And if uh, someone happened to be short of vitamins, again, I would give the advice to seek uh, the, the doctor or surgeon advice to know uh, about a reliable resource, source of uh, vitamins. I think I would, that would be my answer. Thank you, Patrick. I think that sounds very helpful. I think there must also be um, support groups that have developed around and, and perhaps are even more active. I, I know for, for certain that ECPO has really uh, pushed out more support groups than ever in country to help support people who are both living with obesity and going through this pandemic in quarantine. So um, I, I suspect that people are having these kinds of conversations in smaller groups all over Europe, all over the world. Um, here's, here's the next question. Um, Although I have been feeling okay before the pandemic, I can feel the depression coming back. I know the health service is overwhelmed. What should I do? Jason, do you want uh, to? Yeah, I will deal with that. Uh, if you are suffering from depression, you have the right for your depression to be treated. Uh, certainly there are resources within healthcare systems are, which are not being utilized for COVID treatment, which can be used, they're still there and available. As Patrick mentioned, there are the psychologists within the group, there'll be psychiatrists operating. I mean, many of the, you know, many of the physicians have gone front of line to deal with COVID, and many of the clinics have been disrupted because of that. But there are mental health professionals within those teams who will be more than happy uh, in fact, would be able to come in and step in the breach. Moreover, there are other resources out there which you can engage with. Uh, and, you know, you have the right for that treatment. And I think it's important that you get that treatment. And it's, I think, also, although it's difficult uh, sometimes sharing this, I think the support, the mutual support that people living with obesity can offer offer each other which is being currently facilitated by ECPO is very important as well I think sharing worries sharing concerns sharing the, the way you are feeling is very important because depression is an isolating thing and you're in an isolating situation so I you, you're not a burden and this needs to be dealt with thank you Jason that's a good answer um, here's another question. Um, this, is a, this is challenging. Uh, we are in a small apartment, but a busy household with two children 
quick and easy food is best for me, but I find myself snacking too much while making food for others. I think probably everyone has, has this challenge um, during quarantine at such an unusual time, isn't it? Jason, do you want to speak to this? Yes, I'd, yeah, I, I'd, be, I'd be glad to, Sheree. I, no, I, I think we all hear you there. I think, you know, for, for all of us trying to work, look after the family, look after children, school children as well, uh, provides a lot of stress and strains. Now, doing planning and making a schedule is there to help you. It's to help you plan and prepare and feel a little bit more in control. Uh, it helps you bring in times where you're eating, times when you can do some uh, leisure activities, time where you can have some time on your own. And also you can plan meal taking and meal preparation activities around that. Now, obviously these things seem somewhat aspirational at times and then when you don't succeed on staying on your schedule, you beat yourself up about it. The schedule is there to support you. It's, it, 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 it's not some militaristic rule that should govern your life. And if you don't adhere to it 100%, that's fine. But actually sitting down and doing some plan, planning and involving the family in that planning may be a good starting point. And, you know, just keep evaluating where you are, what worked, what didn't work. Uh, and remember, you're not alone in this. Everybody's going through this. So sharing issues with other people uh, living with obesity and, and friends and family and having some discussion a, a, about this is also quite useful as well because you'll, you, you'll pretty soon realise uh, that you're not the only, only person who is like trying to do everything the right way and, and, and lapsing a bit here and lapsing a bit there and then feeling incredibly guilty about it and then feeling a failure about it. You're not. This stuff is difficult. Thank you, Jason. That's uh, great advice. And um, it also might be relevant for the next question, a longer question. Um, this is a person who's living with both obesity and type 2 diabetes and um, is responding to the vulnerability to the serious, potentially serious coronavirus consequences by staying indoors. And he writes, I'm sometimes fearful about opening the windows and have this, uh, I feel like I'm suffocating indoors and hand washing, wiping everything down with, and worry. This feeling leads me right into snacking. <clears throat> I mean, this is classic anxiety, isn't it, really? Uh, and it goes back to what we were talking about in the, in, 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 earlier on in the presentation. Now, I think critically, it's important that when you're living with diabetes and living with obesity, you follow the advice that you're given. But whether that advice should be extrapolated into further measures, I think you need to be careful about. And I think it's worth talking with your healthcare professionals about your current situation and how you're reaching out and, and how it's affecting your life. Because I mean, I'm, I'm no uh, expert on infectious medicine, but I think shutting yourself in and then feeling anxious and can't breathe, I think you're beginning to have anxiety and panic attacks and things like that, that could progress a little. So I think sort of perhaps stepping back and reevaluating the situation and getting some sort of like uh, some of input from friends, from family, from perhaps some from healthcare practitioners and look at resources around anxiety and anxiety management as well. So yes, we have to wash our hands, but not excessively. Yes, we need to uh, be careful about infection. But, you know, if the things that you're doing are beginning to have an impact on your daily functioning in a detrimental way above and beyond living in with obesity and diabetes in isolation, then you're going to start having more and more problems. So I think it's worth having reflection on what is being asked of you in terms of, of self-protection and self-isolation and in terms of what additionally you're doing out of fear and anxiety and what actually uh, is actually a, 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 a reasonable response versus one which is driven out of fear and anxiety. And I think there, 
perhaps taking you know taking getting some support from friends and family and from professionals as well uh, it, it, it is quite it would be quite a useful thing you will not be alone in this by the way uh, thank you jason uh sheree it's just vicky here i just wanted to add some comments if you don't mind as well um uh, what you said there, Jason, I think is um, quite interesting because a lot of the time we see uh, stigma and I suppose the, the comments that we, we don't like coming from our family or loved ones um, who obviously have concern about us, but it's very difficult to take the, the criticism or the comments on, wow, you've gained weight and that. And at, at this time that we're in, um, things have changed so much that these are now the people that we now need the support from and i think something that you hit on there is very important and it's the communication with your family and with the people that you're living with and addressing some of the fears you have and letting them know how real they are um you know i know a lot of my own kind of i can beat myself up in my mind better than anybody else and you know verbalize but i generally don't share that with you know my fiance or my children um because you know it's it's private and I'm, I'm in fear really but the more we communicate with these people the more they will understand and I think that support is a paramount importance right now to many of the patient community thank you that's really helpful I also wonder whether um, Patrick your uh, psychologist colleague might have some reflection on that too because a lot of these questions really seemed focused around they're not tactical they're not you know what kind of you know what do i do if i can't get access to my vitamins they're they're about they're experiential and people are people are struggling it's a difficult it's a difficult time um, i'm just looking at this next question which i can wrap in too um, I live alone. I don't have any of my usual life anchors, walking to the bus, going to work, interaction, eating lunch with others. My remote work it has been curtailed. What can I do to help with the feeling of isolation and overeating? Any suggestions? Yes. Uh, um this situation is difficult for every single person uh, more or less but it is difficult we have to acknowledge that um, every single positive input that enters your life is something useful uh, i just give you an example last sunday was my wife's birthday uh, her daughters are living uh, away in France and we managed to have a, a lunch um, all together uh, through an application it was whatsapp I think uh, which was which she was very happy about because at some point there was something very pleasant for her birthday so it's just one idea to um, um, to fight against isolation. We have talked about uh, community, speaking to others and things like that, but we can do things with others. We can play with others. We can uh, play music with others. We can, uh, through these telephone application, I think this is uh, something to be uh, uh, looked after. Um, what the psychologist working with me uh, insisted on is um, how to deal with emotions. Uh, emotions is something that we are not used to deal with. We are easy with positive emotions, less easy with negative emotions, and very uneasy with fear. Um, we used to say that in the Pyrenees, in the south of France, if you meet a bear, uh, it is very obvious that you will have fear. What do you do about that? Well, um, st strictly speaking, just now, I don't know what to do. And uh, this is what happens today with this infection. It is so unforeseen that many people have 
uh, amazing unforeseen emotions and what already says is can you um, try to know try to name try to think about what these emotions are and can you make sense about them if you feel isolated if it is something um, negative for you um, what can you make sense of it can you call other people can you find a solution or um, is it is there a special reason now why it, it is like that and can you fight this reason i'm not going to go into uh, uh, psychological evaluations and so on but very easy things like that the 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 other tool we can use is physical activity and uh, there are today's on the internet many many um, tutorials, uh, little applications, little video that will help you do very simple things. Um, not only the sports uh, that athletes would do, but little exercises that help you um, do something during the day and um, probably fight against emotion and uh, fear and anxiety. There are also applications about uh, mindfulness, uh, um, controlling uh, breath, and so on, which might be useful as far as uh, anxiety is, is concerned on top of uh, 10 tips that uh, Jason gave. Um, yes, I think that's the main issues, a few more issues. Thank you. That's really helpful, Patrick. I think um, I think just mentioning the word fear, which is something I never hear in the discourse around this pandemic. I hear about um, coping stress and anxiety, but fear is a very relevant word um, here. This I have a question here, which is quite long and I'm going to try to summarize it. Uh, I usually cook dinner, cook our family dinner. Now that we're in lockdown, I have a partner who expects me to prepare all the meals. He is the main breadwinner, so I am working, managing the kids with schoolwork, hand washing, keeping them from fighting, doing my own work. This sounds like real life uh, and managing food for everyone. Now I'm always in the kitchen. I find myself angry and resentful and I'm always around food. Any suggestions? Sorry, I've got, I've, I've got to be unmute there. I think this is, a, this is a, a, there are lots of things in here to unpack. But first of all, obviously being in the kitchen is a real issue and the negative emotion is a real issue. And I think uh, we know that psychosocial stresses are particularly associated with vulnerability to overeat and weight gain as well. And so that, you know, this is quite a serious problem. Now, if you can't talk to your partner about the way that you're feeling about this, then I think it's worth reaching out to others just to First of all, explore your feelings around this and articulate them. I think it's also, if you are confined within home and working relationships and things have changed across the whole family, I think it's worth sitting down and as a family and having a discussion about how things are going to work out better. And perhaps in that context, people can think about their contribution uh, to the family situation as well. It's difficult and I'm not qualified to give advice on relationships. I don't know the situation as well. But what I do know is you're entitled to some self-care and you're entitled to some time on your own uh, to look after yourself. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. That's, that's great. That's a good answer. I think that's going to be helpful. Um, there's another... Uh, 
question about bariatric surgery. So this is a person, I am waiting for bariatric surgery and I had to lose a lot of weight before being eligible for surgery. My operation has now been postponed and I'm worried that I may gain weight. I have lost in the program. If I put it back on, will I lose my turn altogether? Um, any practical steps I can take? And actually, um, if I, Patrick, please do speak to this and then I, I will, I'll turn it over to Vicki because I'm sure she has some comments about this too. Yes, thank you. That's a difficult question because uh, in France, uh, um, the resources for bariatric surgery are important. And therefore, uh, this um, sort of uh, losing, losing the turn is not an issue in France. Um, so it's and and so that we don't expect people to lose weight before they are operated if they do good job if they do not it is not a it is not it's not always an issue if they gain weight it's another issue but if um don't lose weight it's not an issue so my advice would be although i don't know the situation my advice would be, can you speak to the surgeon and try to negotiate something that is uh, pertinent to the situation? If uh, the surgeon can understand that stress and all what Jason explained uh, can lead to dysregulation of appetite, eating behavior, and so on, and um, if the surgeon can understand that uh, the person has put on one or two kilograms, then maybe it's easier for the surgeon to accept that this person needs to be operated. Just to add to this, uh, this has actually been, in, uh, for our medical colleagues, this is a problem that they're, that they're well aware of and they are trying to work very hard with uh, reimbursers who have these requirements to suggest that this requirement should be dropped. So I think many in the medical profession who work with people living with obesity are well aware of this as a problem and are act actively trying to advocate for changes in that rule or at least some understanding of the application of that rule in, in terms of the consequences of the current pandemic and people coming out of that pandemic as well. So uh, yes, and uh, the other thing I would say is there are many, many people in this situation. It's a very commonly asked question. Thank you, thank you, Jason. We're getting close to the end of our planned time. So why don't we move along and I'll turn it over to Vicki who will have some final remarks and she may also be able to speak about that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cherie. It's so appreciated. Um, you know, we are literally at the end of our, our webinar, and um, I want to thank uh, Cherie, of course, um, who is a, a rock for us at ECPO, um, as we are a patient organization. Um, Jason and Patrick, thank you so much for your insights and input. And as this is our first webinar, um, I suppose we're finding our feet and to have your professionalism, to have your experience, and it, use your brains and your knowledge and wisdom has been tremendous for myself. I've learned things that, and taught, reflected on things throughout this, this whole webinar experience that I didn't really think about before, to be honest. Um, so thank you all. And to, to note, there has been some questions there regarding um, whether or not we can share the slides, um, the recording afterwards, um, the images, people appreciated the images, and all of these will be available on the IASO and the ECPO website. So if you um, go to the ECPO website, you will see we have um, a number of images there of, um, I, I, I wouldn't say happy people living with obesity, but there's a lot of our, our team pictures and um, professional photos that are fantastic to use. So feel free to use them. We will circulate all of this afterwards. And of course, there's a lot of infographics and other presentations 
and resources that you can use also. Um, and this also to know that you know, we are all in this together. Um, you know, as Jason rightly said and Patrick, you know, um, use a line to communication with your family, you know, um, get on WhatsApp and have those, those meetings with family and, and share your concerns um, because you know, all of our support has been taken away as people who live with obesity. So utilize what we have um, and go back. You know, we've heard all this before that, hey, you know, if you keep a diary or if you, you know, put down on this food or exercise more and we've heard all this, but let's go back to and revisit everything that we have been told um, and, and do our best. Do not beat ourselves up in our heads, right, in our minds. Do not internally stigmatize yourself. Um, just by attending the seminar or this webinar, you're doing tremendous by sharing it with people that you love. It's impossible in this day and age to not have somebody who lives with obesity in your life, whether it's a colleague or a family member um, or a friend. So share the resources because there are people who literally will not um, speak out like many of us do. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Jason. Thank you, Patrick. Um, thank you to Patrick's colleague who is with him and thank you to Cherie and we will circulate all of this in time. Thank you everybody. Thank you so much everyone. Thanks to all. Best wishes. We'll see you on the next ECPO webinar. Look forward to it. Thank you. Bye-bye everybody.